So when I kickstart a strategic planning consultation with a high caliber financial professional, I often ask the question, what does Nirvana look like for you in the next five years? Like, just paint me a picture. And I would say that at least 50% of the advisors I speak to either speak to scaling up, how to drive their enterprise value, and then eventually talk about their exit strategy. We have a very good conversation about how that will elevate them from a personal and professional development perspective, but also liberate them to restore a sense of energy where the business has been serving their life. And there is no better example to break this down and provide some actionable strategies than this guy right here, Ted Jenkins. I've known Ted for a long time. He is a lifelong entrepreneur and planner. And a number of years ago, in the spirit of planning, he started to investigate what it would look like to focus on the end game. We've all heard the saying, dig your well before you're thirsty. And he started to zero in on options around de-risking and diversifying what had become a massive asset. And he entered into a sell and stay uh, agreement. And Ted, great to see you. Great to be here. And I'd have to say that that was one of the most profound business decisions you ever made. Well, thanks for having me on, Duncan. And I, I will say that uh, it co- sort of reaffirms what I always thought as an entrepreneur. But uh, we try to help build wealth for our clients. But the best, best way for us to build our own wealth is in the enterprise value of our own business. There is no better investment, not the stock market, than your business. It's, it has been true. It's true today, and it will be true that way in the future. Yeah, well said. And uh, everybody, you know by now that the theme of this conversation is that every business is built to be sold. And these are proven strategies to maximize your end game. So, Ted, again, safe to say that the liberation and rejuvenation that you experienced on the other side of your exit strategy exceeded expectations, number one, and then number two, propelled you to become an advisor to advisors to help them maximize their life's work, de-risk, and diversify. Because as we all know, many financial advisors, their enterprise value, their business is their most valuable asset. So tell us what we need to know about your experience and let's get into this. I've got an array of questions I want to ask and let's make this as valuable and actionable as possible. Well, I may make you laugh, Duncan, and say that, you know, every day when I talk to advisors, it's shocking to me the amount of head trash that I hear every single day that advisors tell themselves about what they think about their business, what they think about the industry, and in many cases, what they perceive to be devaluation of their business. It's still bizarre because uh, I guess almost like people talk about the internet today, there's so much misinformation and disinformation out there that I will start with this very simple comment. Everybody who's watching this, you could do whatever business valuation you want. You want to hire a third party? Great. You want to hire Succession Link or FP Transitions or one of those companies? Great. But the only The only place you will ever find out what your business is worth is by taking it to the market because the one place that never lies, Duncan, it never lies, is the law of supply and demand and what the market tells you about what your business is worth. Now, I say this because the whole uh, two times recurring revenue, one time commission, or I heard now maybe I could get three times, but it has to be in an earn out. We find today every single day, and Duncan, we will do 40 of these this year, 40. 40 transactions that most advisors that sell for less than four times revenue are out of their mind. And in many cases, larger practices will sell for five, six, seven times revenue. That's what the market says. So I just want to start this by saying, quit the head trash, okay? And try to get down to the facts about what you need to be doing in your business to get there, like you mentioned, so it can be sold. And then understanding the best way to be able to uh, get that enterprise value. 
Okay, well said. And it's funny because I did want to talk about that signal to noise ratio. And this is what I hear from advisors that interact with you. Because as I said, Ted is still a financial professional. Uh, he's a thought leader. He's a subject matter expert. He's still very much immersed in the financial services space. But what's emerged from his ex, uh, his own experience is that he is now an advisor to advisors. And we have introduced advisors to Ted and his team to help them navigate through what it looks like to maximize that outcome. And the signal to noise ratio is so incredible because ultimately, experientially, you enable a financial professional to focus on what matters, focus on what they can control, and just focus on the signal so they can have a good outcome. I believe that to be true. Uh, you know, and as we've done these podcasts over the years, it's it's getting advisors, I think, to think about as they work with you and they build their business about the real behaviors in your business that you want to be doing and the ones that you don't want to be doing. And whether, you, you know, you're right, every business is built to be sold. Some people on here, it's going to be a lifestyle business. You'll collect checks, you'll take off the summers, and that's going to be your life. Nothing wrong with that. But you want to be in a position of refusal to be able to sell your business. Mm -hmm. Either way, you have to build it the same way, meaning that anything you're doing is what I would call to be a below the line activity. I'm going to define the line where revenue gets separated from expenses that all your energy as a practitioner should be spent on the behaviors of sales, entrepreneurship, and marketing. And if you're not in those three behaviors right now, you are absolutely missing out on the boat. Whether you sell your business or not, those are the behaviors that grow the top line revenue in your business, not managing portfolios, looking at you know risk allocation software, studying somebody's tax return. These are not the things that really drive the revenue in your business. Okay, I wanna to come to that in a little bit more detail as we drill down. Um, I wanna start on the progression. So again, every investment of effort a financial professional makes working on their business contributes to their enterprise value, enables them to start strategizing their end game and to ultimately maximize their exit strategy. Now it's interesting that question I ask, what does Nirvana look like for you? I get a variety of different answers and this is right. what I want to get into. I want to get into the reasons and the options and then the tactics. Okay. So we'll frame it that way. Sure. I hear all kinds of reasons. I mean, I've had an advisor the other day. He said, you know what? It's just, it's just time. It's time for me to, to move on to the next chapter in my life. That's a reason. I've had advisors say, well, I just want to de-risk. You know, that's a big part of your approach. They want liberation, right? The, the, the weight, the minutia, compliance, whatever. They, they, they want liberation. And then there's a continuity and secession component. Whatever the answer is to the Nirvana question, I, you know, I want to go out and write the great American novel. I want to go travel the world, whatever <laughs> right. it is. I want to become right. 5.0 in pickleball. The question I love asking is, why is this so important to you? And, and just making sure that the advisor has this perfect balance between purpose and process. Process is the tactics. Purpose is the reason, the why. I'd love your insight on that. Like, wh what are you hearing? And, and, and what are some of the reasons beyond just the monetization uh, from financial professionals moving toward their end game? Well, I think there's, there's definitely a, a shift right now amongst practitioners to figure out, you know, how do I have more balance in life in general? Um, I, I'm seeing and hearing that more and more. I hear the... I'd love to be able to spend two months in Italy, but I don't know if I can. Uh, I feel like I, I, even if I'm at my kids' stuff, I'm still answering text and, and seeing emails come through my phone because the phone hasn't made things better. It's made me uh, more accessible. But, you know, one of the things I hear, especially a lot from small ensembles and solo practitioners is I, I need to be with somebody bigger. Not like I want to get recruited but I wanna be in something that mm. is transformational in my business and I can't figure out certain pieces of the business so I can scale this bigger. Now that may be 
HR and payroll. It may be money management. It may be that they, they're not great at segmentation. It may not be that they're, they're great at pricing, but a lot of people historically, Duncan, would join large OSD, OSJs to get a, a collaboration. And many of them are realizing by even selling a part of their business, they can de-risk and take some chips off the table, but get into a collaborative operation that's much more accretive to their business than joining an OSJ. It's a big bifurcation in the business, right? Which is, I'm not saying leave your OSJ. I'm just saying that that's not the only option to figure out how to scale your business. And you've got to think through these things, but I'm hearing a lot more about since COVID, especially Duncan, that life short, um, you know, I need money, but money isn't everything. You've heard that from your clients and maybe that head trash that you're starting to tell yourself, you know, I, I need to enjoy some of this. I know I did it for that reason, Duncan. I've, I've never been happier. I've never had more fun and being, being happier than the 30 years I was doing, you know, practice on people. I love my clients. We all do. But I also love life too. And I love uh, doing other things. I just couldn't do it with all the rules, regulations, being strapped down. All of that is making people say, I need to do something. Well, it's a great point. I mean, diversification is not just your holdings. It's your lifestyle. Your ability to, to do all the things that you want uh, now and in the future uh, on your terms. And, you know, your point about the two months in Italy, I often say to advisors, you know, a great proof of concept to see if you are either franchise ready and scalable or to see if you are about to maximize your end game is to take a sabbatical and be in touch, but out of reach and just see if that thing can run like a Swiss watch without you being there all the time. And I know many advisors who have done that and various outcomes on the other side, but um, I do like the reasons and i do like hearing you talk about your own rejuvenation because i think yeah. self-actualization is about plateau avoid avoidance not not maxing out as an individual keep climbing in terms of our personal and professional development so uh, i love hearing Duncan, that I, so one, one other thought on this uh an observation i've had the last three years just seeing this every single day i want to tell all the advisors that listen to the broadcast or watching today here's an observation 5 million is the new 1 million. 5 million is the new 1 million. And many practitioners, even the good ones that are solo people that make a million dollars a year are realizing, I don't think I can get a lot of these $5 million clients all by myself. I need to be interlocked with a group or with a, a company that has the, the offerings to allow me to not get margin compressed on my fees and also be able to provide the services that I need to be able to provide to my clients. And I'm convinced now that they used to say, oh, you know, 50 is the new 40. Well, 5 million is the new 1 million. Say I said it first here, but I bet you, you see more of that come in the news in the next three to five years. So very true. And we're going to get to that right now. It's funny, just the other day, I was walking to lunch with some friends. We we're walking through the parking lot and there was a dime on the ground and we all walked by it. And I went, wow, <laughs> a dime is the new penny. Like it's just dismissible now. Uh, you're absolutely right. Which brings this to a good point. So again, the framework is what are the reasons? What are the options? What are the tactics? Okay. To maximize the end game. We touched on reasons. Let's touch on options. So as you know, many advisors to grow up market where their ideal client shifted from a $1 million, uh, you know, uh, investable assets to five or more in order to grow up market, they had to grow down. And part of the growing down was to start narrow casting and maybe go through a partial book sale. So yeah. you've cracked that code. Let's talk a little bit about that as an entry point, not just to simplify someone's yeah. life, but to help them grow up market. Well, you all probably talk to advisors about this all day, but certainly there's a, a big difference between developing a, a Walmart model practice and having a Louis Vuitton practice, right? They're, they're different practices, but both the brands are well-established, well-known brands. Part of what you have to decide as the advisor is what do you want your, you mentioned your purpose, your process, and, and what do you want the payoff to be? 
And if you're the kind of advisor that said, wow, uh, I started off with everyone who could fog a spoon and now it's, uh, you know, 15 years later and I had people who, you know, they love me, you know, I'm like the, the it's like, a, I'm a Linus blanket for them, but you realize that you really can't service them because they're actually costing you money to service them. It may be time to, to not dump, that's a bad word. As a business owner, the right word is to sell a fraction of your business. Now, most people think of that as, well, I'll just sell 20% of the enterprise value. That's not always the answer. The answer may be to lighten your backpack, take the math and the uh, social studies book out of your backpack, meaning sell the bottom 100 clients to one of those companies out there that either has more junior advisors and can service them, they are built like a Walmart practice, and they, they all work. And this allows you to lighten your backpack to have fewer clients, maybe have a leaner practice and create more revenue and profitability. That's a consideration for advisors who are trying to figure out what to do uh, with those clients. Fog a spoon. Okay, I haven't <laughs> heard that one since I convinced an advisor to stop doing seminars for client acquisition. I said, you're throwing your money at strangers. And I went off on a rant. And there's a long pause. He goes, that's it. I get it. No more <laughs> plate lickers. No more people who can fog no, us. More plate plate. No more trying to convince people with a pulse. I'm all in. I'm going to go with, yeah. and he started to narrow cast. So anyway, funny on that. Yeah. But I think, um, Duncan, you know, what's ironic about this is that we're, in my view, we're moving into a world where wealth is craving exclusivity. So to a degree, the more exclusive you make yourself be, think about how hard it is. I live in Georgia. I'm wearing a master jacket. I get to go. I'm never going to be a member. <laughs> and uh, but, but people would give their right and left arm to play in that golf course. When things are that tough to get into, wealthier people want to get into it. So which way are you building your business, right? Are you open for anybody and everybody to come in and be a member or can only some people be a member, right? That's sort of a, a great operative way to think about it. Well, and you're absolutely right. And by the way, you'll never become a member with that attitude. Okay? <laughs> I, I think it's in, you're going to be invited at some I point. I know my so. place in life, Duncan. I'm not going to become a <laughs> member at the Masters. Uh, I had a conversation recently with an advisor on the topic of a growing down and a partial book sale. And we're talking about how to position it it's, you know, you're not selling your clients. You're actually doing them a disservice by keeping them. Right. And you're doing yourself a disservice because you've got this core of clients whose needs are evolving, becoming more complex. And we talked about alternative investments and how so many of those high caliber clients are either pursuing or already have investments outside of the advisor's process. I said, you're never going to earn that and capture that as it goes into motion if you're all things to all people. So there are many layers to benefits that come from the growing down and the partial book sale. And I'll just tell everybody, Ted and his team have cracked that code. So if if that's a way to ease into this, to, to liberate yourself, to pursue some other interests and to go deeper and grow up market with your ideal client, then you've got to have a conversation with Ted. More on that in a second. I don't know if we've ever talked about this next one. I had a conversation with an advisor not long ago who was telling me that he's got a protege, uh, a, a team members in place that he wants to hand the torch to. And he was talking about uh, basically self-funding the transition. And I said to him, I said, uh, from a risk management perspective, you're at the mercy of their continual execution to fund that, perhaps you need to look at alternatives, uh, uh, intermediary who can finance that transition uh, to give yourself some certainty, but also empower them to have real skin in the game. So uh, thoughts on that? God, I hate that idea. Uh, I, I hate it. I hate every bit of it. Uh, first of all, um, listen, if you, if you believe the best way to get your valuation is to, you know, wait 15 years to get your money or 10 years to get your money or seven years to get your money, go ahead and do it. Most advisors who do that, by the way, Duncan, that I've seen, they don't even attach an interest rate to the way they get self-funded back. So it's almost like getting a pension plan that doesn't have a cost of living adjustment. And, and you're going to be your own worst enemy, which is why you want representation. 
when you have the two uh, puppy dogs in your office that have been your girls or your boys the last 15 years, and they've been your loyal soldiers, you think you're going to get your best price? Or are you going to say, I just want to make sure that I take care of them and I take care of my clients. And in the end, you're actually going to do a disservice to yourself mm -hmm. by not getting the best value you should get, even if you do sell it to your other advisors. So a lot of, a lot of times, like having somebody there as a third party, take some neutrality out of your own emotions of selling your business. I hate the idea of the self-funding. I've seen advisors do it. It's the old world of the way that it was done. Um, and you do have a lot of risk. The, if you leave and the advisors blow up your business, you got a big problem. Yeah, exactly. And um, I, I mean, I get the nobility. They have been loyal so soldiers. They've earned the right. But talk about no good deed goes unpunished. I mean, one substantial revealing market downturn or jolting episode and it's so revealing mm -hmm. and then of course the the person who's at most at risk is the that let me let advisor. me give you a real live example for everybody on here I, I recently had an advisor that was uh at cambridge uh he's basically been with a junior advisor in his business the guy was more like an indoor cat than an outdoor cat right he wasn't a hunter he really was a servicer no claws on him and the thing is that they've been splitting 70, 30 on business in an informal way for 20 years. So it's almost like living with somebody 20 years underneath the law, you might be considered married because you've been, you know, splitting business that long. And uh, in the end, the advisor pursued a transaction and, and basically said, you know, I'm going to give you, you know, a little bit of money for, for being here this long. The advisor said, wait a minute. I own 30% of the business. I mean, I, I've been I've been getting a 30% payout. I, I've been getting 30% of the profits. And and the other advisor said, no way, man. You you just been here taking all this business that I've given you all these years. That's all you've been doing. Turn into a huge war. The advisor split up. Nobody won. And they're in a massive legal battle now. My only point to you is that you might have a few people in your practice that are indoor cats. Great people, servicing clients, no claws. They do a great job for clients, but they're not going to be able to rain make for the business in the future. And you got to consider all that when you think about the totality of, of selling your practice. You've up your analogy game, I see. <laughs> it's very, very good. I'm taking notes and most of them involve humor, metaphors, <laughs> and analogies. I like them. Um, okay. So, of course, we have many advisors um, that... Uh, the transaction is brokered internally within the firm. And there's a time and a place for that, of course. But I think your favorite, I mean, it's what you experienced yourself and those 40 that you're moving through and helping them navigate through their exit strategy uh, this year. Uh, I think your favorite, of course, is the sell and stay. Yes. So there's reasons, there's options, there's tactics. Yeah. I mean, Let, let's listen, talk uh, more about that. I, I'm in the real M&A world outside of financial advisors. So I'm selling businesses every single day. And I would ask every advisor on here to go do your own research in the last 25 years and see what the average of the S&P 500 is, and then see what the average of the private stock index is and try to compare the returns on those businesses. And it, besides your NVIDIAs of the world, I get it. Publicly traded companies are basically a slow locomotive train relative to privately traded companies. Now, I say this because what's great about a sell and stay option is that if you do this right, you can get enough cash at the close or the early years of the closes to put yourself in your own financial position where life's going to be good no matter what. Your clients aren't going to have a noticeable change whatsoever. You're going to get paid to continue to run the business. But most importantly, if you take some stock or swap some stock, you're going to be on a locomotive train that's moving so much faster than your train ever could. So much faster. Now, I can tell you this because when I did mine, uh, the stock has basically tripled in value in five years. If I had run my practice and I kept it five years later, I wouldn't have tripled the valuation of the practice. Why? Because I'm so much smaller. And, and as a small train, I can move fast. I could cash flow, but the valuation of my business is never going to be as fast as a much bigger company moving at a much higher multiple. Now, you would think Duncan advisors would understand that because we're in the business of math and finance, but it's not really what we do every day. 
So I'm really trying to help advisors here and understand how I help people build their net worth, meaning you, the advisor, not just your client's net worth. Okay. You covered a lot right there. Let's, I, I need to revisit this. So what you're saying is, okay, walk me through that again. Your sell yeah. and stay. So you had I, a liquidity event. Right. Okay. Go, what, just I, slow so down saw, and walk me I through it again. I saw my practice. I got 80% of the deal was cash. Now the cash was part of close. There was a, an earn out in the process. Usually for most people, the earn out is tied to revenue retention. Not if Mr. Jones takes his account or not if you got 3% of your clients doing RMDs. It's tied to revenue retention. And then eventually most of the companies will want what's called to be a Kager balloon, meaning on EBITDA or revenue that they expect some annual growth rate of your business. Kind of makes sense. I don't know why you'd want to be in a locomotive train that's going zero miles an hour. So, you know, we want businesses that are going to grow. Now, some, it may be 10%, some it may be 15, some it may be 20. And that was the nature of the cash structure of the transaction that I did. I took 20% stock. I've said this before on podcasts. Regretfully, I think I should have taken more because I really didn't need all the cash and in my entire lifetime of doing financial advice for people and buying investments myself, I don't know how many I've had that have basically tripled in five years. And why did it triple? Well, I was in a pool, Duncan, with basically 30 or 40 other very strong wealth management practices that have 99% client retention. They have 90% plus recurring revenue and they drop 50% of the cash flow to the bottom line. How many businesses do that in Canada or the United States? The answer is zero. So we're, we're not only in the best industry, we've got the best margins on our business. Ergo means it's a pretty darn good investment. So I'm only telling you this because you can keep reinvesting in your business and that's fine. But your stock, if you're like a $2 million producer, will never move as fast as a stock that has $200 million in revenue. It just will not move as fast. Okay, so that's where the accretive multiplier was quantitatively, the lift of the stock of the 20% yeah. that you wish was maybe right. 30 or 40. But I want to come back to the qualitative multiplier. Are you a better entrepreneur? Are you a better financial advisor? Do you love what you do more now than you did five years ago? Even when I was an employee, Duncan, after I sold my practice, I liked it more because you know what? I didn't have to worry about doing all the interviews to hire somebody. There was an HR department. I didn't have to click ADP every week and figure out if payroll was done right and who got expense reimbursements and all this other stuff. You know, there were, there were uh, parts of the business. I didn't worry about money management at all. It was all outsourced. So, you know, the, the thing is, it, it lightened my backpack to basically do what I love to do, which is be a marketer. It's my favorite thing in life. And then after that is selling. and and. uh Life just got a lot better. And, and so even if you sell and stay for the next 20 years, I bet you your life is better than just the way you're doing it today. Unless you want to be the, the entrepreneur that's, you know, lean practice. I hardly ever talk to clients. I, again, three months in Italy, I get it. But um, I don't think you'll build your net worth as fast as you would by doing a transaction. And I think that's the interesting twist to the end game and the exit strategy is it's... Um on your terms, which means if you want to stick around and just focus on the things that you love to do, because I tell you, again, a strategic planning conversation, I asked the Nirvana question, I asked them why, and this advisor, there's a long pause, uh, exhaled, and he said, you know what, I'm just tired. I'm tired of, and he listed off the minutia around hassle factor, HR, and things that he doesn't have scale or expertise in but was part of his reality because it was his business. And your point about outsourcing, automating, allocating, uh, it's so much power, more powerful to, to draft in behind somebody that's got scale to liberate you to focus on what you love to do. Because I said to him, what do you love to do? And what would your life look like if all you had to do was what you loved to do? You could feel the energy change in that conversation. So I'm glad you broke that down a little bit further. Reasons, options, 
tactics. Let's get into the weeds on tactics. So, you know, our mindset, we say, look, depersonalize. It's not the Ted show. It's not the Duncan show. Make yourself obsolete. My favorite question to ask somebody who's, who's thinking about getting to that next level is, what does your business look like if you took a month off tomorrow? What does that look like? Describe it for me. And let's describe what it looks like if your associate or your protege takes a month off tomorrow. No warning. What does it look like? Interesting conversation around depersonalizing the business and emphasizing the practice and the process, not just the people. Thoughts on that? Hey, look, I learned it the hard way. Uh, it was the Ted Jenkins show for a long time, right? I, I, I was the guy. Uh, I was the guy on the radio every week. I was the guy doing TV, and and uh, it feels good at first. And it's like everybody says, "I want to be famous one day." Until you can't eat at a restaurant without somebody stepping up to your table, right? And so, um, yeah, I will tell you, like your name may be on the door. But it doesn't necessarily mean it has to be your face in in every single aspect of the business. And that's the biggest mistake I made in the business as I was growing it. And we had a successful business, but it didn't come without a lot of uh, <laughs> a lot of you know brain damage. Uh, I, I just I, I wouldn't be in the middle. And then two, the biggest one after that is money management. Uh, head trash yourself that money management is important, that you can beat the s and p five hundred, that you're a great stock picker that you got some dynamic strategy that nobody thought of before, then you should just quit the business and become a money manager. Go work for a portfolio company, right? But it, it's not what's going to drive your business. I finally learned in the end that if I had a good, solid strategy and a good story behind it, it didn't matter if we were the people changing you know, the wheels and hubcaps all the time. Yeah, Absolutely. Well, it's interesting. I've I've gotten an uh, uh, an acronym. You're great at metaphors and analogies. I'm great at acronyms. We all have our skills. <laughs> the acronym I use with advisors to frame their preparation uh, is top. Reach for the top, right? Reach for the top. So T O P. Tidy. How tidy is your business? So I want your opinion on that in a second. How tidy is your business? How organized is it behind the curtain? Orderly, like, is there consistency in your client acquisition? Is there client retention? Are, are you perpetually at red line? Is there order in your business? And also, is there um, probability for growth and, and bandwidth? And then, to your point, proprietary. How much of what you focus on can a client only get from your practice and your process? Your your uh, point about how you manage money, I mean, it's obviously incredibly important, but it is commoditized. It's not proprietary. I love it when advisors get all serious with me. They say, look, you don't get it. We we do things differently here. Right. We take a holistic right. approach to financial planning. And I'm like, oh, okay, good. You're the one. You're the one who does that. <laughs> no disrespect. I mean, your core competency, your right. intentions, your moral compass, all of that is incredibly important. But that is not proprietary. I can get that somewhere else. There's a placeholder for that. Let's talk about the things that are just yours, your practice, your client experience, your model for client acquisition, your brand within a brand, your process, your way. I'd love your feedback on any and all of that. Well, um, you know, what's, what's true in general is that, and it, and it makes all of what makes sense about building a business to be sold is to completely systematize the business. Um, I talk to a lot of advisors around the country in many shapes and sizes, and, and almost none of them have the same initial client meeting outline for all the people that work in their firm. They may not have the same strategy session. Some people in the firm have a different money management approach. And it's like, our thought initially is that, that we're going to uh, not look as good to the public if everything looks scripted and systematized, whereas all the great brands around the world are completely scripted and systematized. So again, I, I, I keep using this word head trash. It's such a head trash thing because all the great businesses in America are completely scripted. Um, you know, that that's just the way that they work. Uh, and then you've got to think about 
uh, your brand. Many advisors don't think about the brand and how valuable it is in terms of lead gen and what it means to the public. When I opened Oxygen in 2008, uh, I was the first really to do the X and Y generation before anybody thought about it. And we sold fun, Duncan. We sold that you weren't, we aren't your parents' financial firm. I had no financial magazines. I actually had an oxygen machine that you could stick in your nose in our lobby. We had a Wii gaming station. I served all the drinks for Gen Xers that reminded them of their childhood. Sunkist, Mellow Yellow, Yoohoo, Tab. And people would say to me, not, you guys are great at financial planning. You guys are great at money management. They would just say, you know what? I like it here. <laughs> and and so, and we were one of the, really the first to do credit card transactions. I was charging people a monthly Netflix fee to become their financial advisor. But the whole thing of it is, it's like, what's the brand stand for, you know? And, uh, you know, everyone believes that the differentiation has to be in financial planning and money management. Not true. Not true. We use the money. We got red tail for our CRM. And we didn't have that much that was different in there, but we had fun. And people like the brand and they talked about it. Most advisors are on the third floor of some nondescript building. It says Jenkin Wealth Management. You walk in, there's a picture of a bull and a bear and, uh, you know, and CNBC is on. Congratulations. You just copied every other advisor in the country. And, uh, you know, we, we just didn't do that. That's what made us great. It was that it was the way we sold the brand, not all the other stuff. Well, first of all, backing up, I loved the whole dynamic about making sure that every messenger on the team follows the same messaging. Yeah. In terms of how they conduct themselves, their decorum, uh, even the way they articulate value. It's funny, Ted. I, I always say to advisors, like, don't just focus on what you do. What is your value? Well, what is it? Focus on what it does. Like, what do your clients want? They, what do they crave? You know what people crave? They crave consistency and they crave belonging. They want to feel like they're in good hands. They don't want to dread a strategy meeting. They don't want to dread a phone call. They don't want to dread an email. They want to in, look forward to it. And the energy around the environment that you created uh, with the tab and the, you know, sun kiss, it's just, it, I'm in good hands. It's a, it's a good environment. So that's interesting as it relates to branding, but backing up around building a sale ready business back to the, I, I'd like some pinpointed uh, insights on the top acronym. Okay. Tidy, tidy, pro, uh, orderly, proprietary. Can you yeah. work through that and provide some insights there? Well, on the tidiness, I would just say, um, are you, are you actually tracking the business metrics of what somebody would want when they buy your business? So do you actually do a P&L? And if you do, is the P&L tidy? Um, or does it have like, you know, your kids, your wife, your car, all the other stuff? Could you actually tell somebody today, tell me what the sellable EBITDA is in your business? And uh, could you explain your business? Because you're going to have to. Um, do you know what the concentration looks like in your business? If you look at the top 20 clients, is it 10% of your practice or is it 70% of your practice, right? So, the, you know, you look at the concentration risk in your practice. So you've got you've to be very, very tight with the numbers because when buyers buy, you can have all the emotional stuff about the business, but you got to be able to explain the math of what's going on in your business. You will have to do that. Orderly to me is having your ducks in a row uh, legally, right? Uh, I had one guy, Duncan, who was selling. He goes, I, I said, we need to get your operating agreement. He goes, do you think I have one of those? Yeah, I think you have one of them. Where is it? You probably have a little brown binder on your, in your desk somewhere that you did in 1987. It's somewhere, but you know, look, you got to have your employment contracts tidy. You got to have, if you have 1099s, the 1099 contracts, do you have stuff that protects your confidentiality? You know, what risks do you have in the business? Um, as I mentioned, is it systematized? Is it going to be easy to run? Do you have an organic marketing machine, a way to bring on new clients every year that you could prove that you could have growth if the market's down 15%? This is getting things in order. And then from a proprietary uh, perspective, can you create one or two things, whether it's brand driven or it really is process driven, that is wildly different? And you mentioned it, your financial planning and your money management 
are not different. I know you're going to be like, no, you're wrong, Ted. It, we're, we're so much different, but I met thousands and thousands of advisors and you're right, Duncan. They all say the same thing. Like, well, it's not us. I mean, we, we really do a very different approach to money management. Okay. So does, so does Ken Fisher. And he's got a lot more money than you do. Not because his money management is different. He just crushes you in marketing. That's the difference, right? He may say he does better money management. I say this on here. I don't think he does. I really don't. I can probably find thousands of more people that do actual better money management. It's fine. I'm sure it's decent for customers, but he's the best marketer I've seen ever since I got into the business. That's why he's better. That's why Edelman's better. These guys are master, masterful at marketing. Back to the proprietary in top. Um, is there any value to having testimonials either written or on video from clients talking about what it means to be the advisor's client? 100% recommendation is to use vocal video. I mean, obviously you got to check with your compliance department and the rules and regulations, but as you all know, a lot of, a lot of those in many places, the rules have dropped. Yeah. I'm not, I'm not telling you that people are stupid. What I am saying is that people are highly influenced, by what they read and see on the internet. So to have a choice between Ted and Duncan, if Duncan's got 47 five stars and Ted has two, and Ted is actually truthfully a better advisor, not going to matter. Duncan will get the business. So court of public opinion is more important than it's ever been before. So the much of that you can get out there, the better off you're going to be. Okay. So in terms of tactics, I just want to make sure everybody knows, and I'd like you to elaborate on this. You have a checklist, you have a playbook to help a financial professional navigate through this, to stage their business, to make it sale yeah. ready for maximum value. You've got this in place? I've got two things. Yes. I've got a checklist of, if you're like T minus two years, three years away, uh, obviously you're doing coaching right now, which you should get a coach. Um, but we have a checklist of exactly how to do this top that Duncan is talking about, right? Especially getting things tidy and orderly so you're ready to get the thing sold. In addition, for everybody at the podcast today, if you go to sellyouraum.com, sellyouraum.com, I'm going to give you a free market valuation of your business. I will tell you today, even if you're not planning to do anything, don't waste three grand on a business valuation. I'll tell you what the thing is worth because I see, I've seen offers from 50 firms. So I know what it's worth. I just, you just got to let tell me some data and I'll tell you what the practice is worth. Oh, that's invaluable. I mean, the only thing I like better than saving three grand is the fact that my brand new top acronym is getting traction in real time. <laughs> I like it. I like it. It's going to replace some of the metaphors. <laughs> Uh, okay. So back to your, okay, we can, we can wind down here. Your call to action is go to sell your AUM.com, yeah. have a conversation with Ted and the team, um, do the valuation, go through that exercise, get your hands on the checklist. And I tell advisors in terms of expectation management, I'd like your feedback on this. It takes between nine to 18 months for a financial professional to properly stage and organize their business for impeccable curb appeal and maximum value. Am I in the right ballpark? There? No, you're exactly right. It's going to take at least nine months to get a transaction done in some cases a year. So you're, you're exactly right. And that's why I said, listen, if you're not ready for five years, it's a great place to start with us. You know, we're happy to give you whatever insight we can today. Maybe we'll work with you down the road. Maybe we won't, but you know, we're trying to help advisors build their own net worth and bring their practice full circle. If you don't mind closing with a story or an insight about how somebody feels on the other side of this in terms of their legacy, their personal fulfillment, the rejuvenation in their life, I'd love to hear any insight there, not just yourself, but any of the clients you've worked yeah, with. Yeah, look, not even me. I mean, one of the first practices I ever did was for a, an OSJ-ish type practice up in Boston. There was a younger partner and an older partner, and the older partner was able to get out of the business. He had always dreamed about traveling around the world to play all of his favorite golf courses, but just couldn't do it in the context of all of his management responsibilities. And since he sold the business, I've never seen the guy happier. He lives in Sarasota part of the time now. He lives part in Boston. He bought a nice place down there, and he's the happiest I've ever seen. And that is the greatest gratification for what I do every day.
Yeah, just giving somebody permission to go and actually see yeah. that happen, right? Okay, excellent. Ted, thanks very much, everybody. Sellyouraum.com, kickstart the exercise, engage with Ted and the team, get your hands on the checklist, go through the exercise, and then we'll start working through the playbook and see if there's a good fit. And 100%. I'd love to hear your success story on the other side of it. Ted, great to see you, man. Thanks very much. All right. Thank you.